Okay, uh, so we're going to be looking at transport in multicellular organisms. Specifically, we're looking at transport in plants. And what we're going to be using is a lot of the stuff from the multicellularity lesson from the other day. Okay, when we talked about uh, the layers of the leaf and the xylem and the phloem and all of that, we're also going to be going back a little bit and looking at the polar nature of water and how it contributes to the transport of water and nutrients in a plant, okay, things like that. So, one of the big things here is that multicellular organisms, unless they have some form of active circulation, are still bound by the properties of cellular transport even though they're having to transport throughout an entire organism. Okay? We kind of bypass that a little bit because we have a circulatory system and it pumps blood everywhere. But blood while blood vessels, sorry, while you know numerous and, and obviously you know all encompassing throughout your body, don't reach every square inch of your body. Okay? Stuff still does have to diffuse or move by osmosis or move by active transport within your cells or into your cells. Okay? That still occurs even in a multicellular organism. But in a plant, it's particularly obvious because cellular transport processes are used to transport things over large distances. Okay? Now we said for diffusion, that isn't good. Okay? And I'm not saying that plants use diffusion to transport things from their roots to their leaves. Obviously, they don't because it would take too long. But what they do use is osmosis. Okay? Osmosis creates a lot of pressure. And that pressure, in at least small volumes, can be used to move material from over large distances. And that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so we've got to understand how nutrients, water, sugar, and minerals are transported in vascular plants. We have to learn the structure of vascular plants and look at the forces involved in this transport. So there's a, a fair amount of stuff in here that will be important for the rest of the unit in terms of multicellular organisms, especially the plant and transport. Because on Monday, we're going to set up a lab where we look at how does a plant transport water. Okay, um, and basically, it's kind of like maybe what you did in like the fifth grade where you put the celery and the food coloring water and you watch the water. It's kind of like that except we use a real plant. We cut the roots off okay? because um, we want to take the roots off to eliminate them as a source of any force that could push the water up. Without the roots, we know the force has to come from only where? Yeah, and, and, and osmosis from the leaves. Okay, So it kind of proves that's kind of what we manipulate is that we're taking parts of the plant off and eliminating them as a source of, of any pressure or force. Okay? So we'll be looking at that. We'll run that over the course of a few days and, and look at the appearance of the plant as well as the change in volume of the water. Okay, so the problem for terrestrial plants, and we are focusing just on terrestrial plants. That's plants that live on land because aquatic plants never have any problem transporting water. Why not? They live in it. In fact, they have no structures for transporting it because it's not a limiting factor. Okay? It's always there. It's always present. Okay? If it's not, they just die. Okay? But for a terrestrial plant, the resources they require are not in the same place. That's what spatially separated means. Okay? Um, water and nutrients are in the soil, but sunlight is not. So one resource they need to make food they have to have stuff above the ground for. And one resource they need, they have to have stuff below the ground for. And these two things can't carry out all the life processes on their own. Okay? Sure, the leafy part can carry out photosynthesis. It's in the sun, but it, doesn't get, it, it can't absorb water. So it's got to have these friends down here that are getting water for it, and then some cells in the middle that are capable of moving it around. Okay? So that's where that whole specialization comes in. Okay, soil provides water and minerals, but there's no light underground for photosynthesis. So, the body of a vascular plant is differentiated into a subterranean root system. Okay, that means underground, subterranean. Okay, that absorbs water and minerals and an aerial shoot system of stems and leaves that make food. Okay, so some examples of different adaptations that plants have made, okay, evolutionarily speaking, over the course of millions of years. Um, how many people have ever grown strawberries or have strawberries in their garden? Okay, you never notice how they kind of crawl 
right? Suddenly another strawberry plant just kind of appears over in another place, okay? I mean, part of that could be that a strawberry fell there and the seeds came off and it actually grew. But most of the time what it is, is the, the strawberry plant puts out what's called a stolon, which is a special type of stem. And when it touches ground somewhere else, and that ground has nutrients and water, it'll develop another plant at that location. And then it's like a pipe that runs from that plant to the original plant, and it can actually transport water from one location to the other through the stolon, because this plant, being large and mature, could exhaust the water and minerals in this location if there's been like a long drought or something like that, whereas over here, there hasn't been a plant there, um, you know, so maybe there's a little bit more nutrients and water, so they can move it across. Raspberries do the same thing if you have a raspberry patch, okay, like they just start coming up, and they'll come up in your middle of your lawn, okay, like 20 meters from the from the raspberry plants, they put these things through, and they can really spread out. Um, cassava and potatoes, they have an adaptation for storing energy. Okay, um, while the plant is carrying out photosynthesis and the growing season is going on and conditions are good, it carries out way more photosynthesis than it needs to stay alive. So it stores the energy in its roots in a special root called a tuber. Okay, that's what a potato is, is a tuber, okay? Uh, not tumor, tuber, okay, it's different, okay? Um, so they, they, uh, they essentially just store starch, okay? Starch is plant fat, really, okay? When we have excess energy, we store it as fat, okay? When plants have excess energy, they store it as starch. And uh, essentially what these can do then is they can be drawn on the next spring as a source of energy to get the plant growing again. Okay, there's a lot of energy stored in a potato, uh, which is why if you've ever planted potatoes, all you do is take a potato, cut it in half, and stick it in the ground. If you've seen the movie The Martian, that's what he did. Okay, that's what Mark Watney did. He he took you know the the potatoes, put them in the poop that he got from the space toilet, and uh, and and they grew. All he had to do was cut them in half. As long as there's a couple of eyes on that potato, okay, there's enough energy in that potato to supply, uh, or to give energy enough for it to get a shoot through the ground and then it can carry out photosynthesis after that, okay? So that's essentially what, uh, what they did there. But that's also why potatoes are a high energy food, okay? When you eat fries or baked potato or mashed potatoes or whatever, you're eating stored plant energy, okay? Um, so they do have a lot of energy in them. And it's the same with like cassava, which is a rhizome similar to a tuber, okay? Things like that. Um, other plants, they'll also store energy in the form of sugar at the base of their leaves. Okay, onions are an example of that. Uh, garlic would be uh, also one kind of, anything that has a bulb, okay, is kind of storing sugary uh, material there uh, for energy for the long term. Okay, questions on that? Everyone's good with that? Okay, so the reason we got to have all these specialized tissue is because the resources are in different places. Okay, another important terrestrial adaptation of vascular plants is lignin. Okay, I mentioned this a few classes ago. Okay, it's a hard material that's embedded in the cell walls. Okay, that functions in support. It's what makes tree trunks and any any kind of stiff plant structure. Okay, anything that's wood. Okay, that's caused by lignin. It acts like a cement that cements the cell walls together of many cells, okay, making it very hard. So. Why do terrestrial plants need lignin? Right. I mean, if you think about the two things that are essentially limiting factors for a plant on land, they're light and water. Okay? Carbon dioxide is always plentiful. They never have to worry about that. It's never a limiting factor. I'm sorry. What I mean by limiting factor is the thing that could cause their growth to stop. Okay? Anything that, that essentially causes you to stop would be your limiting factor. Um, water is obviously available in the soil, but if the soil dries up, then water becomes your limiting factor. But if you are short and you are growing in a forest, light is going to become your limiting factor because all the plants around you are going to do what? They're going to shade you out. Okay? Make no mistake, guys, there is competition between plants. Okay? It's easy to envision competition between all the wolves in a pack for food, but there's competition between plants for light in exactly the same way. 
Okay, the way you win is to be the tallest or the broadest, okay, or both in a lot of cases. If you look at the tropical rainforest, being tall and broad is an advantage because then you get the most sun and you shade out your competitors. Okay? So lignin has allowed plants to achieve a more vertical dimension okay, and then obviously be taller and gain more sunlight than their, than their competitors. Okay? It's also used sometimes to protect seeds. That's how you get the hard shell of a nut. Okay, it's the same kind of material. The cell walls that make up the shell of the nut have a lot of lignin in them. Okay, pine cones. Okay, similar thing. There's lignin in pine cones, um, and in fact, some plants their pine cones are covered in a resin. How many people have ever picked up a pine cone that was all sticky? Okay, now, now certain types of plants, especially lodgepole pine, okay, will have um, will have their their cones covered in resin. That means that the seeds can't get out until what happens? Exactly. Until a forest fire comes along and burns them. Then the resin melts or burns off and, the, and then the pine cone dries and cracks open and the seeds come out. Why would a plant want, to, want its seeds to wait till then? Yeah, exactly. It wants the other plants to be wiped out. Imagine you're a little tiny sapling and you're growing in a forest full of mature trees. How much sun are you going to get? Yeah, basically none. You're going to get shaded out and die. It makes way more sense to have your cones covered in this resin that won't open until the parent plants are dead. Okay? Then you don't have to compete with them for light because, well, they're dead. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? Okay? So it's another good adaptation of you know, kind of cellular structures, okay? things like that. Okay, turgor pressure. I talked about this quite a while back when we talked about the water vacuole, but just kind of touching on it again. Okay, unfortunately, I watered my plants so they all look healthy, but I took pictures of them the last time they didn't. Okay, so these are those two plants over there. Okay, um, when I hadn't watered them, look how awful they look in these pictures. Okay, like the leaves are all droopy and and awful looking because all well, this was like they'd gone the whole summer and I forgot to come in and water them which happens every summer, I never remember. Um, so anyway, they looked awful, right? But then I watered them, and they just perked right back up again. You can see that the leaves are all now kind of vertically oriented because those water vacuoles have filled back up, and they're exerting turgor pressure against the cell walls, and the plant can support itself again. Okay? The reason that water leaves these vacuoles is not because the plant cell uses it for a, a water reserve. It isn't that at all. Okay? The water vacuole is not a water reserve, but I see people write that for its function all the time. The only reason water would come out of there is because of osmosis. As the plant becomes dehydrated, okay, water has evaporated from it and left what behind? Salt. Well, not a cell full of water, but the, as the water evaporates, any minerals that were in it get left behind, and that's going to create an osmotic pulling force or osmotic pressure that draws water out of the vacuoles, and eventually, you can see in this picture, the cell membrane actually starts to peel away from the cell wall in the latter stages of wilting, okay? um, and it isn't until you can get those water vacuoles filled back up again that you can get the plant to return to its original shape. Okay, so. Uh, turgor pressure is pressure of water in vacuoles, okay, and it contributes to the support of small plants, okay, but it cannot hold up a large plant. That requires a lignified skeleton, okay, well, skeleton is maybe a bad word, but a lignified frame, okay, that can hold it up. Okay, questions there? Okay, so essentially there's going to be three parts to the plant. The roots. Okay, the roots are the part of the plant that does essentially two jobs. Acquire water and nutrients and anchor the plant. Okay, are roots generally pretty good at that? Yeah, most plants will break off before they will be torn out of the ground. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, okay? We see evidence of lots of times of a plant that, you know, the wind was so great or something like that that it actually physically tore the roots up and completely uprooted the plant, okay? You see that sometimes, but most of the time they root strongly enough that the plant will break 
before it will be torn out of the ground. Now, there's two different types of root systems. A tap root, which is a single deep root, okay, and a fibrous root system. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. A tap root generally will go a little deeper, generally. Okay. It can also store food, okay, like a carrot or a parsnip or a turnip. Okay, things like that are tap roots. Okay, um, so they can go fairly deep and they store a lot of starch. Their disadvantage is they can only access soil that is near the root. If you have a fibrous root system, you can spread out. You're probably not going to be as deep, but you can cover more area. Okay, so there's an advantage and disadvantage in terms of surface area for absorption. Now, obviously all tap roots have these little root hairs that come off. Okay, if you've ever pulled a carrot out of the ground, you can see the root hairs that come off of it. We usually peel them off with a peeler because people think they're disgusting, but they're actually good for you. Okay, yeah, I, I eat them. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, um, but yeah, they, they, uh, they help to increase the surface area for absorption of materials. Okay, which one is going to anchor you into the ground better? You, you know what, lots of people think that because, again, of the, de the depth that a taproot can reach. But here's the problem with a taproot. It's going to act as a pivot. If the top of the plant is swaying, what's happening to the bottom of the plant? It starts to sway too, and it can actually work itself right out of the ground. Okay? It can work itself loose, okay? and then the plant can be uprooted. Okay? Whereas a fibrous root system is grabbing onto a whole bunch of different places within the ground and is actually less likely to be uprooted than a fibrous root. Okay? Taproot plants are also more susceptible to breakage. Okay? A taproot can break. If you've ever, you know, lots of times when I'm pulling carrots out of my garden in the fall, I'm like, okay, I'll get that one out and I get halfway out and it snaps off. Okay? Because they're so, they're deep, but they're also stiff. Right? Whereas with a fibrous root, you're probably going to leave a lot of the root behind. All right, um, beans are a good example of a plant that has a fibrous root system. Lots of fibrous root systems have these little growths on the roots, little nodules. Those little nodules actually contain bacteria that take nitrogen from the atmosphere and turn it into nitrates, okay? which is what's in fertilizer. Right? So these plants can actually uh, create kind of their own fertilizer, which is why oftentimes when a farmer is rotating his crops, okay, plant, uh, farmers don't usually grow exactly the same crop on a piece of land a whole bunch of years in a row. Um, lots of times they'll work um, beans or field peas or something like that into the rotation because you don't harvest this part of that plant. In fact, you never harvest the roots really of most grains or, or crops. Um, so what happens is these nodules that are full of nitrogen get left in the soil. So you've essentially put some nitrogen back in the soil by growing these plants over the course of a year. You don't have to put fertilizer in because they can make their own and they're going to put some nitrogen back into the soil. So it's a way to avoid the use of chemicals for a year or two um, and, and replenish your soil in a more natural way. Okay, so what do roots do? They anchor the plant to the, to the soil and they absorb minerals and water. Okay, the stems. Main purpose of the stems, support the leaf structure okay, and transport nutrients and water. Okay. Sure, stems are often green, and sure, they do carry out a little bit of photosynthesis, but it is not their primary job. Okay? They can be supplied with food by the rest of the plant. Their primary purpose, to get the foliage as high as possible and keep it supplied with water and nutrients. Okay? Also, the stems are responsible for new growth. Okay, so on the ends of, ends of stems or in areas where there's a, a branch, you'll often see a bud. Okay, those buds contain those parenchyma cells we talked about in the multicellularity lesson, the stem cells that can become anything. Okay, um, and the reason for that is if one of these branches was to be removed, like you see here, 
those buds would then grow into replacement tissue. They would grow new, new branches, new leaves, things like that. Okay? Because if you're a plant, you have predators. Okay? You just can't run away from them. Right? I mean, if you're, if you're a blade of grass and you see a cow coming, you probably quake in fear. Okay? Because that's your predator. Okay? It's going to come and eat you. Um, so a plant's got to be able to recover from that. Okay? If it gets eaten, it's got to grow back from somewhere else. Okay? And um, if you, anyone have a hedge in their yard or bushes that they prune or trim? Okay? Um, if you want to make a hedge, like really full looking, you trim it all the time. You always clip it. You don't clip it really far back, but you always clip the outside of it. Because what you do then is you force it to grow from a little bit further back. And it looks fuller. Because okay? you get more leaves on the outside. Okay? If you just let those plants grow, you'll get these like two stringy branches. And that'll be your hedge. Okay? Which would suck. So as it grows, so you never let it get to this point. When you first plant it and it's only about this tall, you trim it. And then it grows a couple branches out for each one of these. You let all of those grow. And then you trim them. And then each one of those grows another little branch. And this thing gets full really fast. Okay? And that's how they make like hedge mazes. Have you ever seen like The Shining? Okay? They have the big hedge maze where Jack Nicholson goes crazy. And You guys are looking at me like you've never seen that movie. You're not old enough to see that movie. That's why. But yeah. when you are old enough to see that movie, it's a classic. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can make a big hedge okay, simply by trimming and making it look fuller and fuller. It's the same with grass. If you let your grass grow really, really long before you mow it, when you mow it down, it's going to look awful. Okay? But if you're mowing it often, okay, it's going to grow from below and it's going to get thicker and fuller. Right? So that's a result of some of the stuff that's in the stem, these buds. Okay? Um, so the stem does need turgor pressure and it's also going to, depending on the type of plant, need lignin in the cells. Okay? You don't see leaves using a lot of lignin because being stiff and wood-like in a leaf is not a desirable um, kind of thing. Okay. I put this diagram in yours, right? Okay. This is the yeah, it's there. This is the best diagram of the leaf that you have in your notes is this one right here. Okay? The C4 leaf, I'm not as concerned about. I'll talk about it a little bit, but I'm not going to test it. Okay? A C3 leaf is your common form of leaf tissue. Okay? And again, it's an example of a bunch of specialized cells doing a job. Okay? Um, so leaves are the main photosynthetic organs okay, of the plant. Okay? Um, and they can be arranged in a number of ways. You know, sometimes a plant makes leaves that just kind of go over each other. Sometimes it puts them, you know, at kind of specified distances. If you're looking at like a spruce tree or a pine tree, the, the needles are the leaves, and, and those are always arranged almost geometrically along the branches. Okay? Um, but the way a plant distributes its leaves is, is based very much upon what kind of conditions it grows in. Okay? Does it get direct sunlight or indirect sunlight? Okay? Uh, is the sunlight angle going to vary a lot throughout its growing season or is it always going to be overhead? Okay, if we're talking about a plant that's an annual that only grows for one season, it typically has broad leaves that face straight up because when it's growing, the sun is pretty much directly overhead. Okay, but if we have a plant that grows year-round, the angle of the sun changes and so their leaves are bound to be arranged differently so that it can catch sun no matter what angle the sun is at. You guys have noticed the sun's angle changes, right? Okay. Like during the summer, it's, it's straight overhead, but now when it, like it rises over here and kind of makes this weak arc, okay? like by December 21st on our shortest day, it kind of peaks up about here and goes like this, and our day is like six hours long. Okay? The, the, the angle of the sun is going to change. All right, so within the leaf, we have the palisade. I'm not worried about the term mesophyll. You can cross mesophyll off. Okay? I always just say palisade layer, okay? and this is the spongy layer down here. Okay, we have the upper epidermis, which we said is responsible for secreting the cuticle, that waxy covering to the, to the leaf that prevents evaporation. Okay, the, the upper epidermis, you can see in this diagram, has basically no chloroplasts. It's not carrying out photosynthesis. It allows light to go through to the palisade layer that does carry out photosynthesis. 
and then you can see the spongy layer down below full of holes where water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen can be exchanged. You got your guard cells down, be here, down below here in the lower epidermis, making up those stomates that can open and close and control the amount of water that is lost. Okay, um, now generally a leaf consists of a flattened blade, a stalk, and a petiole. So, excuse my artistic ability here. That is not bad, actually. Okay. The blade is the flat part that basically does all the photosynthesizing and where you would see this arrangement of cells. Okay. The stalk is this part. And the petiole is where the leaf joins the branch. Okay. So right here would be the petiole. I very rarely use those terms, and I've never asked anyone to label that diagram. Okay? Just so you know, if I ever use the term blade of the leaf, that's what I mean. Okay, um, The C4 leaf here, just for curiosity's sake, this is what a cacti has for an arrangement of its cells. Because cacti's leaves are their what? Yeah, they're quills, they're, they're thorns, okay? The thorns on a cactus are the leaves. They don't carry out photosynthesis. They've evolved to the point where the leaf doesn't carry out photosynthesis anymore. The bulky part of the, of the cactus is what carries out photosynthesis. And you can see here, the reason for that is, is that that will conserve more moisture. Not having all that fragile leaf tissue exposed to the sun helps you to keep the water in the center. So the arrangement is the palisade layer looks quite a bit different. In fact, it's almost absent, and it's arranged right around the veins. So there's no spongy, there, well, the spongy layer is there, but you can see it's much smaller, okay? And it's much more tightly packed than, than it is in this leaf, which is, again, going to eliminate a lot of the evaporation. You'll also notice stomate here is a lot different than this stomate. It's four cells. Okay, which really can help it to close those off tightly and prevent evaporation. Okay, and if you've ever felt a cactus between the thorns, not on the thorns, okay, it's very, very waxy. Okay, they have an extra thick cuticle secreted by that epidermis okay, that helps to prevent evaporation. So a cactus doesn't really have leaves that carry out photosynthesis. That's the thorns. Okay, they serve a protective function, obviously, keeping things from eating them where they would lose water. Other thing. If you've ever, you know, thought, well, if I was in the desert, I'd just, like, punch a hole in a cactus and drink the water out of it, it doesn't work that way. Okay, it's not like a cooler, and it's full of water on the inside, okay? Um, the tissue does contain water, but it's not going to come pouring out when you punch a hole in it. What you have to do is actually cut the flesh of the, of the uh, cactus and suck the water out of it. Kind of like, a, it would be like a cantaloupe, except it's horribly bitter, Okay? and alkaline, like, yeah, it's not going to be this pleasant thing, but you'll get fluid, okay? Um, but yes, it would be a similar in texture to a, a cantaloupe or a honeydew that's not ripe, okay? So it would be kind of hard. Some cactus, and if you eat the fruit, because cactus make berries, A prickly pear? Like the small ones? Yeah, yeah, and over, like, like from here, right? The kind that grow here? Yeah, yeah, a prickly pear. Those do taste good. A swarrow cactus, like on the taco time side? Yeah, those don't. Those, yeah. yeah, no, you're right. Prickly pear actually do taste good. And if you can get the, uh, the fruit that they make, the fruit is really good. The, prick, the actual pear part of the prickly pear, the, the fruit is actually quite sweet. Yeah. Okay, this diagram you also have, and it's important, okay? It's showing the different uh, steps that I'm going to go through on the next slide, okay? Um, this here picture is just, I was telling you back when we talked about the polar nature of water, that the tubes had to be really, really small in order for the polar nature of water to work for cohesion and adhesion to support the water in the stem without it falling back down, okay? Well, this is an electron microscope picture 
of the xylem, that's the water conducting tubes of a tree. Okay? This distance here is 100 micrometers. So, most of the tubes that transport water are these small ones. Okay? These bigger ones are probably not transporting water because they're too big. Okay? But these small tubes, I mean, get a look at those, they're probably all less than 10 micrometers across. Okay? Now, there's hundreds or thousands of them, okay? but they're all really small because if they're any bigger than that, there'll be too much water in the tube and it'll be too heavy for the hydrogen bonds to support and it'll fall back down. Right? So there's the osmotic pulling force from above that we'll talk about in a minute, okay? but that only pulls up. What has to hold the water together is cohesion and adhesion, and we know those hydrogen bonds are weak. Okay? If we have too much water in the tube, it can't be supported by those forces and it'll fall back down. So those tubes are incredibly small. Okay. All right, so following the steps on this diagram, step one. Roots absorb the water, okay? And they do that by actually having kind of a reverse osmosis. That's sorry, that's a terrible term to use because that's how you purify water. Uh, it's osmosis in reverse, okay? That is, they try and get salt concentrations kind of high in the roots so that water is drawn in. As water is drawn in, that salt gets diluted, and now we have um, more of an osmotic pressure from above, okay? So, um, Step one is the water gets drawn in by the, by the roots, okay? Step two, the roots, in order to do all these functions, have to be carrying out cellular respiration, okay? So that's what we see in step two here. Oxygen is coming in, carbon dioxide is going out. They are burning the sugars that are provided by photosynthesis in the leaves. So that sap goes down the tree, and they're burning the sugars down in the roots, okay? I mean, all the cells in the plant are burning sugar, but the roots are the only ones that can't make it for themselves. Okay, step three, the water is being transported up the plant in the xylem, okay, in the xylem. The xylem tubes are the ones that carry water up the plant, and they are always in the center of the stem, okay. That's happening because water is a polar molecule, hydrogen bonds are occurring, there's cohesion and adhesion in there, okay. What's causing the pulling force is step four. As water evaporates from the leaves, the minerals that were dissolved in it are left behind in the spongy layer of the leaves. Okay, so there's a lot of salts collecting in the spongy layer of the leaves. That creates an osmotic pulling force that pulls the rest of the water up to try and balance the salt concentrations that are increasing in the spongy layer. So it's that osmotic pressure that acts as a suction pulling the water up the plant. Okay, Does everybody follow me there? The key thing here, because I've said it like four times now, the key thing is it's an osmotic pulling force okay, from above. And that osmotic pulling force is created by water evaporating from the leaves and leaving salt behind. Right, so if a plant depends on high salt concentrations in the leaves to create osmotic pulling force, what would happen if a plant was growing in really salty soil? Austin? Yeah. Exactly. Remember that osmosis is passive. Organisms can't control osmosis. If a plant is growing in soil that becomes really saline, it'll actually start drawing water out of the plant. It'll suck it right out of the plant. It'll make the plant transport happen in reverse. Okay, because again, osmosis is passive. You don't have any control over it, which is why you very rarely see plants growing in really saline areas. Okay? Like for example, around here, if a, if a wetland dries up, you can see the white stuff on the surface of the soil. Okay, what's that white stuff? So it's all the minerals that have been sucked out of the soil, okay, because the soil was saturated. The water picked them up, and then the water evaporated, and they got deposited on the surface. You very rarely see a plant growing in that stuff, and if you do, it's stunted, kind of orangish color, okay, because it's just really hard for a plant to transport materials when it can't create this osmotic imbalance in the leaves. All right, as a result of the water evaporating, Photosynthesis can take place. Carbon dioxide comes in, oxygen gets, uh, gets released, light is used to make the sugar. Okay, so 
five and six are essentially the process of photosynthesis. Some of the sugar stays in the leaf and it gets used to support those, those cells. Okay? But a lot of it, because they produce more than they need, is going to be turned into sap, phloem sap in particular. And that sugar is going to flow down the phloem, which is near the outside of the plant, down to the roots. Okay? What, uh, what, force uses, or what force is used for, for that? Gravity. Always use what's free. Gravity is free. Guaranteed to pull down at all times. Okay? All right, so the phloem is always on the outside. It's always the outer layer of the plants, okay? Back when I was in university, we had this nice kind of open grassy area behind our dorm, and we'd always go out there, play football, or you know, do something out there. It was really nice. Um, and then the forestry department decided they were going to rescue some trees from somewhere, and they planted them in this grassy area, a whole bunch of them. Well, it's kind of hard to play football when there's a whole bunch of big trees that have just been planted in your kind of field area. So we weren't terribly impressed by this. And we had a guy in our dorm who was, well, his nickname was Tree Mugger because he was in forestry. And that was, you know, tree, it made sense at the time. Um, anyway, he said, that's okay. We can take care of those trees. We're like, I think they'll notice if we go out there with a chainsaw and cut them down. Like someone will say something and we'll get in trouble. He goes, no, no, we don't have to cut them down. We'll just ring them. I'm like, well, you're the tree mugger. <laughs> so he takes a little piece of cable and he shows us. He goes, okay, just put it around the tree and just do this. And we're like, well, you're going to cut the tree down. No, no, no. He said, go in about this far, about an inch, maybe less. You don't even maybe have to go in an inch. Just make a ring all the way around the tree, about a half an inch to an inch thick. No one will notice it, but the trees will die. And we're like, why? Because then the sap can't get to the roots. Now what he did is he showed us how to cut the phloem so that the sap would leak out near the base of the tree where no one would notice it and it wouldn't get to the roots and the roots would starve and the tree would die. So we go around and ring all these trees. Okay? And uh, somebody noticed the trees were getting sick. That was something we didn't think of. Um, so the trees started getting sick. The forestry department comes out and notices the trees have all been ringed. And they write all this stuff in the university newspaper about these vandals. <laughs> um, anyway, they, um, yeah. But here's the forestry department was too smart for us. They actually made paper mache casts over the rings we had made on the trees. So, because what's paper mache? Paper mache? Old tree, right? So they made these paper mache casts that went over top of what we had done, and it essentially became new bark for the tree and sealed what we had done and the plants survived. And for a couple of years after, you could see the bark grow over the newspaper. Like you could see the cartoons even like kind of growing through the bark. It was actually kind of neat. So um, see, and now it served a purpose. I was a vandal and then it served a purpose later. Okay, um, So yeah, there you go. Um, the phloem has to carry that stuff down to the roots. You can't interrupt that flow or the tree will die. Okay, so that's steps one through seven. Okay, I just kind of explained them, so I'm not going to go through them again. But okay, that diagram, along with these seven points, is really important because that's transport of water in plants and transport of sugar in plants. Okay, so the two tissues responsible for that stuff are the xylem and the phloem. Okay, so you can see here in this diagram, phloem is on the outside, xylem is on the inside. The xylem is really dead phloem cells. Okay, that's really all, all it is, okay, because the tree always grows from the outside. We talked about that the other day. That's why there's rings in the tree, okay? So, um, phloem and xylem. Okay, so the xylem transports water up the plant, okay, using the two processes we've described. Adhesion, a hydrogen bond between water and the inside of the xylem. Cohesion, a hydrogen bond between two water molecules, okay? So that's what's going to keep the water from falling back down. It's not going to pull the water up, but it's going to keep it from falling back down. Okay? Transport is accomplished by osmosis. Okay? So as water evaporates okay, from the leaves, the remaining solution becomes more concentrated, and that pulls more water up the stem to balance the concentration. So if I was to ask you to explain how water is transported up a plant, I would expect to see an explanation of osmosis, 
a mention of polar nature of water with both terms, adhesion and cohesion, as well as some mention of hydrogen bonds, okay, um, in your explanation. All right, questions on that? Okay, and the phloem transports the sugars down, okay? Um, so phloem transports sugars, okay, down the plant, okay, and uh, that's accomplished by gravity, okay? The process is much slower than the movement of water up. A plant needs to move way more water than it needs to move phloem sap, okay? Phloem sap is thick, it's viscous, okay? Like if you've ever seen, um, you know, maple trees being harvested for syrup, okay, they put that tap in them, the sap doesn't come flying out of that tap. It's not like you crank it open and it's like the faucet, okay? It, it like drips out. They hang a bucket on there and it drips over the course of several days. And that's why maple syrup is so expensive, okay? The real stuff is really quite expensive because it takes a long time to make it and each tree doesn't actually put out all that much sap. You can't harvest all the sap out of that tree or it'll die, okay? So you have to be very careful about how much sap you, you take. And how deep in do you suppose those go? Yeah, not very deep at all, right? The phloem's on the very outside of the plant, so it's not like a big spike driven halfway through the tree, okay? It's just going into the phloem. It's just catching the outside, okay? Not very deep at all. All right. So um, diffusion and osmosis are still required a little bit, but that's mostly to control the thickness or the viscosity of the phloem sap. If they start to get too thick, osmosis will cause water to move in there and thin it out, okay? Um, if it... If it becomes too thin, then usually it starts to move the other way. All right, perfect timing. Because okay, the bell is going to go here any second. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you get a chance, have a look at these. Okay. We can talk about them on Monday because we'll have a little bit of time after we get the lab set up. Okay. Also, don't forget your cell anatomy labs due next week. Okay. On Tuesday, don't forget.